It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, speaker, my first question is to the Premier. Last night, Oshawa was devastated by news of the possible closure of all of its General Motors operations. There are nearly 5,000 families in Oshawa whose livelihoods rely on these jobs and whose lives are now on the line. Can the Premier provide an update on his conversations with GM, Speaker? Premier. Well, today's uh, announcement that GM is, is going to make is absolutely devastating. It's devastating for the people in Oshawa, the people that not only work at GM, but the surrounding areas that rely on GM workers. It's devastating for the supplier base. And I think a lot of people are forgetting about the supplier base, that 6,600 people could be affected by this. I just want to reassure each and every person that's being affected by this, our government will stand shoulder to shoulder with them. We'll do whatever it takes to make sure they get back on their feet and they get proper training. But again, we will make sure that we are there for these people and we will turn it around. We're going to stay positive even in a negative environment like this. And I guarantee you, and I promise you, Response. that they will be back on their feet. Thank you. Very good. Supplementary. Well, I'm very disappointed, Speaker, by the yeah. Premier's response. Nearly 5,000 people, families actually, 5,000 families rely on GM to put food on the table. I think we can all agree that we can't just stand by and let GM walk away from a community that they've been a part of for over 100 years in the province of Ontario. So my question is, what steps is the government willing to take to ensure that Oshawa maintains operations as General Motors restructures? Premier. I had a conversation with the Prime Minister this morning, making sure that we're both on the same page, and I can assure you we're both on the same page. We may have our political differences, but when it comes to supporting the people of Durham, in Ontario, we're on the same page. A couple of the asks. <laughs> we're asking for a series of changes to the employment insurance eligibility, uh, similar to what has been done in the past for the forestry and Alberta's oil patch. We want to extend the EI eligibility by five weeks to, to the maximum of 50 weeks from 45 in impacted EI regions, as done or in hard hit areas before. Position come to order. Extend, extend the duration of work sharing agreements an additional 38 weeks to 76 weeks and allow immediate reapplication for the expired agreements as currently being done for the forestry. So if people are working part time, they're still going to be eligible for EI. Reintroduce the career transition assistance initiative to retrain workers. Thank you. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, I'm pretty shocked to hear not only is this government prepared to leave those workers dangling without a job and not fight for their jobs, but also he's telling us, the Premier's telling us, that the federal government apparently is not prepared to fight for the jobs in Oshawa. People don't want an adjustment program. They want to keep their jobs. That's what they want. So I ask this government and this Premier, what support has the government offered to the mayor-elect and the people of Oshawa as they work to keep their good jobs in their community? Premier. I'll, I'll continue on, uh, Mr. Speaker, through yourself. Uh, as part of the, the assistance uh, that we require is to develop a plan to increase EI durations for long-tenured workers. So if someone's been working there for a number of years, that they're impacted, and especially the EI regions, because EI is broken into regions. Uh, increase the federal transfer to Ontario for skills training via labour market development agreement and uh, workforce development agreement. What we're what we're proposing, Mr. Speaker, since we're order, since what we're we're and proposing come to order. Man, they, they don't they don't want you to uh, to speak around here again. As a first step, 
I'll be authorizing Employment Ontario to deploy its Rapid Reemployment and Training Services program. This will provide impacted local workers with a targeted local training and job services to help them regain employment as quickly as possible. We spoke. Next question. Next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next, jo uh, my next uh, question is also for the Premier, but I have to tell you that in 14 years of being in this House, I've never seen a government roll over so quickly and throw in the towel on good jobs in this province. The Premier has been critical, and we all know this, the Premier Order has been critical government of government investment designed to create and retain jobs. We saw that all through the campaign. But right now, as nearly 5,000 people face the loss of good jobs, the government of Ontario should not be ruling options out. The Premier, is the Premier prepared to work with GM, the community, the workers and others using all tools at the government's disposal to ensure investment and jobs stay in Ontario? You know, Mr. Speaker, it's easy to be an armchair quarterback, sit there, a Monday morning quarterback. But through you, through you, Mr. Speaker, the first thing I talked to the president of GM last night, the first thing I said is, what can we do? What do we have to do? And he said the ship has already left the dock. So now what we're going to do is continue doing what we've been doing to create good paying jobs, to make sure a company is never in this position Opposition again after 15 years of terrible policies. Don't think this policy, their, their decision to change over to another location happened yesterday. It didn't happen in five months. It didn't happen in six months. It happened well Order. over a year ago. But what Democrats we're going to do, we're going to make sure all three Response. levels of government must work together for the impacted families through this difficult transition. All three levels of government will work together and make sure that we do everything we can, from making sure they have proper training to make sure we extend the EI benefits. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, it's all so much easier to call the game than to buck up and fight for good jobs. This government's calling the game. The auto sector is a vital part of Ontario's economy, and government policy has been crucial to ensuring that that, that industry has been successful in our province. However, in the past, this Premier has shunned the idea of an auto, in, uh, auto strategy, and they have denounced the role of government investment in creating jobs. The people of Oshawa need to hear that the Premier is ready to use every tool at their disposal to protect their jobs government in Oshawa. Can the government give people that assurance? <laughs> Through you, Mr. Speaker, you want to buck up and stand up for jobs? For 15 years, you destroyed this province. 300,000 jobs were destroyed because you voted for the Liberals 97% of the time. You destroyed the, the energy sector. You destroyed manufacturing. You destroyed. 300,000 families that are trying to put food on the table. That's what you destroyed. We're turning this province around, Mr. Speaker. We're lowering energy costs. We're lowering gas prices. We're, tra we're creating an economy that companies want to come to Ontario for the first time in 15 years as you destroyed this province hand in hand with your Liberal buddies. You raise taxes, raise energy costs, raise gas prices. Response. You're for the carbon tax. You have personally destroyed this province. That's what you've done. Stop the clock. Order. Government benches come to order. Come to order. Order. I would remind all members to make your comments through the chair. Start the clock. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, notwithstanding the way the Premier behaves, I think most Ontarians know that 
that the NDP has informed government in Ontario in some Order. time, but we're looking forward to doing so because the turnaround that this government's providing is turning us backwards and hurting families, the latest of which are 5,000 families in Oshawa. The people facing the threat of job loss government today need to know, order. Speaker, that their government is going to fight like hell to keep their jobs. Apparently, they have now found out the government doesn't give a darn, and they're going to let those jobs walk out of the province. But what those people need is to hear a government that is going to reach out to GM and to GM workers and to municipal leaders Bond, to bring all of those people together and work to save jobs and investment in Ontario. That's the government's job, to work to save jobs and investment in Ontario, not to Minister sit by and wave bye-bye to, to jobs as they leave. Will the government be doing that, Speaker? Will they be actually fighting to keep jobs and investment in Oshawa, in our province? Premier. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, Leader of the Opposition is demanding we spend billions and billions of dollars to a company that doesn't want it. They're done. They're gone. They're done. They told me straight up, there's nothing we can do, Order. absolutely Number nothing. What the NDP believes in, they believe in championing corporate welfare. That's how you create jobs, according to the NDP. We have a different philosophy. We believe in creating an environment for companies to come here by making sure that they have low taxes, that we're lowering the corporate tax rate from 11.5 to 10.5%. We're lowering the hydro bills down 12%. As for everyone's brand, driving brand, around and getting endless Texas with gas prices, the lowest gas price now is 97.9 cents. That's true money in the pockets of the taxpayers. Stop the talk. Order. Restart the clock. Next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next uh, question is also for the, for the Premier, but I, I got to say the uh, reduction in corporate taxes obviously didn't save GM from leaving That's Oshawa, right. and the government refuses to fight for those jobs. is quite shameful. Uh, but my question this time is about Franco-Ontarian families. Uh, and in fact, uh, Franco phones across Ontario who felt abandoned Order. and attacked by the Premier and his government when the fall economic statement cut not just a few Member French, not Markham just a new French language Order. university, but the French language Member services Markham watchdog Stouville. as well. On Friday, the Premier announced changes to his planned cuts and a newfound respect for Ontario's Francophone community. Uh, is, the government, uh, is that the government's way of acknowledging rather uh, how reckless the cuts were that they announced in their financial statement, Speaker? Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to hand, in, hand this over to the new Minister of Francophone Affairs. Yeah. Minister of Francophone Affairs. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very happy to have the opportunity to talk about the new strategies that we announced on Friday. Our government will suggest uh, amendments to Bill 57 to make sure that the Franco-Ontarians, that the Office of the Francophone Affairs will be independent. And furthermore, today I was uh, sworn in as Minister of Francophone Affairs in Ontario, which will give a better voice to the Ontarians in this from this government. But what's really important is that the Prime Premier asked to hire a francophone uh, consultant for francophones to give him uh, advice about francophone affairs every day. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Well, it's unfortunate that the minister, regardless of what portfolio she, for, portfolio she held, wasn't fighting at the cabinet table in the first place, Speaker. The Premier's budget 
cuts are now a national issue, and the Premier's friend Andrew Scheer doesn't want to be seen with them anymore. By singling out the Franco-Ontarian community as a target for cuts, the Premier has sent a signal that this government does not respect the key role that Franco-Ontarians play in our province's history and our future, Speaker. So will the Premier do the right thing and reverse completely for York Center, these cuts come to order. immediately? Minister. Mr. President, not Mr. Speaker, our government respects Franco-Ontarians. Our government respects all Ontarians. It's done differently from the previous government, which made an announcement of a Francophone university without a funding. We are talking directly to Franco-Ontarians, and we're telling them that we are ready to work on this university to move forward, and when this province will be on a good, prosperous uh, way, we will give funding to this university in a different way from the Liberal government. Next question, the member for Durham. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Last night, people in my community of Durham were shocked by the news that General Motors would be closing its Oshawa assembly plant. We've made cars in Oshawa for more than 100 years. Thousands of my constituents either worked at GM themselves, still work there, or have friends and family relatives uh, that work there. Speaker, I want to ask the minister to inform the House what steps our government is taking to help the people of Oshawa and Durham Region at this difficult time. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thanks very much, Speaker. I want to thank the member from uh, Durham for her advocacy on behalf of the residents in her community. Uh, the Premier and I were informed yesterday when we spoke to Canadian General Motors leadership about the global restructuring of General Motors that uh, was going to be taking place that not only affects uh, the Oshawa facility, of course, but affects a number of other facilities across North America and even around the world. Uh, I took the opportunity this morning to inform my caucus colleagues from the Durham region and also had the opportunity to talk to the NDP member uh, who is from Oshawa, Jennifer French, this morning, and the member from uh, London, Peggy Sattler, to update uh, the NDP members on uh, what was happening in this uh, restructuring globally. I can tell you that there are jobs that are going to be saved here in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. The CAMI facility is going to remain open. Uh, we also know that the engine plant in St. Catharines Response. will remain open. The technology sector in Markham and Oshawa will be, remain open. But when the member of uh, the uh, leader of the official opposition was offered a briefing, she said no for some reason, Mr. Oh. Side come to order. Order. Start the clock. Supplementary. Speaker, I'd like to thank the minister for his swift action on this file. And, and just as a note, I hope the member from Oshawa and I can find a way to work together for the people of Oshawa. I know the minister was up to the wee hours of the morning after the news was leaked, consulting with local officials, including myself, on how to best help our communities. Speaker, the closure of the Oshawa assembly plant will have effects ju uh, beyond just the city of Oshawa and just the jobs at the plant itself. It's a sad day that we got to this place in Ontario where a U.S. Uh, Head tenants. office made a decision that it's no longer competitive to do business here. Can the minister tell the House what further steps he and our government are taking in order to help our auto sector and thousands of Ontario workers deal with this announcement? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Minister. 
Thanks again, uh, Speaker. And our thoughts do go out to everyone in Oshawa and the Durham region. Uh, this facility was very, very important to the economic uh, stability of, of Oshawa for a hundred years. Uh, we'll be meeting this afternoon. The Premier and I will be with uh, GM Global uh, to talk about their plans for the future. And we are going to do everything we can as the government of Ontario to ensure that there is growth and expansion in those other facilities in Ontario. But again, this is a global restructuring that's impacting General Motors uh, across North America and around the world. I think it speaks, though, Mr. Speaker, to the economic mismanagement that we've seen at various levels of government over the last number of years. I can tell you that if you're looking to build a plant in Ontario, you want to have labour laws that work. You want to have low taxes, Mr. Speaker. You want to have low electricity costs, and you don't want to have Response. a carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. All things that the NDP are supportive of. We want to clear the ground. We want to make sure that we have a fertile soil for employment here in Ontario, creating good jobs. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Next question, the member from Mishkigawak, James Bay. Monsieur le Président, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Mr. Premier, last week, your government made decisions to appease the Franco-Ontarian resistance facing your insensitive policies. Despite that, the government did not uh, restore uh, the uh, French Services Commissioner nor the university. Furthermore, the budget cuts to the cultural organizations, such as uh, the Gilles Desjardins in Ottawa and the three educational magazines. All these issues are absent in your decisions. Here's my question. If you're ready to listen to the Franco-Ontarians, why not restore the French language office and cultural Grants and the University. Minister of Francophone Affairs. Minister of Francophone Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And thank you for the uh, question from the member. We were very proud to announce uh, since Friday uh, that we will. The, pre the Premier listened to the Ontarians, and we will amend uh, Bill 57 uh, to create uh, the uh, French language office under the auspices of the Ombudsman's Office to preserve the independence during investigations and recommendations to improve services in French and to foster the law on French services. We listen to French Franco-Ontarians and we will uh, table amendments which will uh, face those issues. With respect to the uh, French University, we will continue working uh, to uh, develop this uh, project. When we are ready to do it, we will uh, give real funding, unlike the previous government. Mr. Premier, Wednesday, uh, the uh, official opposition leader will uh, table a motion to ask the government uh, to Stop to uh, come back on its decision about uh, the funding to the French University and the French office. Will the Premier, Premier support this motion? Mr. Speaker, I'm asking the member to correct what he's saying. We did not abolish the French office service. It was integrated to the Ombudsman's office with all the responsibilities, and it will continue to, to work independently, which is very important for linguistic rights in, in Ontario. It's uh, an office to, that will be independent. And with respect to the French University in Ontario, I will ask him to ask uh, the question to the uh, independent members from the Liberals. They're the ones who created the $15 billion deficit. We have a $340, $340 billion debt, which is unacceptable. We will put Ontario on the right way. And uh, when we will be ready, we will uh, put this university project on the right way.
start the clock. Next question, the member for Flamborough Glanbrook. Thank you. And Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Honourable Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Last year, Ontario's 49 children's aid societies, including 11 Indigenous societies and three faith-based societies, served more than 100,000 families. Across our youth justice system, roughly 7,500 youth were diverted from charges or formal court proceedings through extra judicial measures. Yet we've seen a disproportionate number of youth in crisis in Ontario's Indigenous communities struggling with their mental health. Minister, what is this government doing to improve outcomes in Ontario's child protection system? Good question. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the wonderful question. I think it's important that we continue to talk about Ontario's most vulnerable in this legislature during question period so all eyes can be seen um, and, and to be looking and doing uh, stuff more to protect uh, children and youth. Ontario's most vulnerable children deserve better, and we will be holding those responsible to higher standards. We're committed to better outcomes for children in the protection system through the creation of three new roundtables dedicated to sharing ideas of empowerment and that will respond, direct, uh, directly respond uh, and uh, report to me. The new roundtables will be made up with those with lived experiences in the fields of Indigenous child welfare, children in care and youth in custody. The establishment of these new advocacy tables will have a direct access to decision makers. I'll also be requesting that Ontario's Ombudsman immediately review all pending Spons. investigations and reports by the previous child advocate to ensure no child falls behind the cracks. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and back to the Minister. We first announced through the government's fall economic update that Ontario's Ombudsman's Office will be assuming responsibility for investigations related to Ontario's children. This added responsibility means the Ombudsman will have oversight of children's aid societies, youth justice facilities, child welfare, and mental health services. The proposed changes will mean that the authority to investigate services provided to children and youth will continue at a higher standard. Minister, with the added responsibilities, how will the government ensure a seamless transition to keep our children safe? Good question. Minister. Because it does seem that the, uh, the, the New Democrats don't think the Ombudsman provides enough uh, stringent investigative reporting. But let me be perfectly clear, under the new, uh, the new changes, there will be Mountain stronger and higher standards put in place for investigations through the Ombudsman's office than has ever been done before. That's why we're creating three advocacy tables that will be led for, for Hamilton Mountain come to order. Is children in custody, children in care, or Indigenous-led children. We are going to ensure that there's a children's unit within the Ombudsman's office. It will be turnkey. Remove, they will be moved from the previous uh, advocate's office over to the ombudsman's office. And as I've just said, the stronger investigative powers by the ombudsman has ensured that I will be able to ask him to review all pending investigations so we can ensure greater child protection in the province of Ontario than we've ever seen before. And I'm very proud of this government for taking such strong measures. Here's off the clock. Restart the clock. Next question. Member for Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question for the Premier. Last week, we learned that OPG had sold its Hearn generating station property to a company controlled by Mario Cortellucci. The price tag was reported $16 million. That's only about one quarter the price per hectare that OPG received when it sold the Lakeview property earlier this year. It sure looks like a bad deal for the people of this province. Will the Premier allow an independent appraisal to verify the value of this Toronto waterfront property? The Deputy Premier. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, Ontario Power Generation operates at arm length from the Government of Ontario and is responsible for its own operational decisions. In this case, Studio of America has leased this land since 2002. The terms of their lease included the first right of offer to purchase the land if it ever became for sale. By divesting this land, OPG has shielded taxpayers from any long-term environmental liabilities associated with a former coal generating station. This decision is in the best interest of taxpayers, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. 
Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Premier. Independent, like hiring and firing Mr. Velshi. I'm sure totally independent. This deal is raising a lot of concerns. The city was not consulted on the sale. More concerning is the fact that Mr. Cordellucci is a major donor and fundraiser for the PC party. And his family members made several contributions to the Premier's party leadership campaign after he won. He wanted to make sure the bet was sure. The Premier seems no more interested in getting to the bottom of this as he is in finding out whether his chief of staff arranged to have an OPG executive fired. The people deserve better. Will the Premier allow an independent investigation of this sale? Minister. Minister. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. OPG is responsible for their own staffing decisions. They are a Crown Corporation that makes its own decisions, uh, staffing decisions and operational decisions. As I said earlier, Studios of America has leased this land since 2002. The terms of their lease agreement the had the first right of offer to purchase the land if it ever became for sale. As I said earlier, by divesting in this land, OPG has actually shielded Opposition taxpayers from any long-term environmental liabilities associated with a former uh, coal-generating station. This decision is in the best interest of taxpayers, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Ottawa, Vanier. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question est pour le. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This question is for the Deputy Minister with regard to the fall economic. The government announced that it is seeking to review and possibly cancel support for businesses, possibly cancelling the program Invest Ontario, which has assisted businesses to invest in Ontario with all types of incentives and information. After cancelling program uh, support for electric vehicles, for green economy, does the Premier think that it is wise? in light of the Oshawa closure, to cancel programs designed to help business stay in Ontario. The Deputy Premier. Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Thank you very much. We uh, have made many provisions in the fall economic statement to help uh, those most in need uh, in our province of Ontario, but we have also uh, made some provisions for the business community. So I can tell you that while the Liberals did have uh, tens upon tens of millions of dollars of new taxes that were going to both families and businesses starting in, in January, we have uh, announced that we will not be proceeding with any of those uh, individual and uh, small business and corporate taxes that were scheduled to kick in January 1. That's about $308 million. So if you're a uh, senior on disabilities or Response. those who collect uh, medical expense tax credit, you would have suffered the most. You will not be receiving those Liberal taxes in January. Supplementary. The fall economic statement also excludes seniors from rece who receive pensions and presumably the Oshawa workers who will receive some assistance from the tax credit called LIFT. Does the Premier think that it is appropriate at this time to exclude seniors who receive pensions and workers who receive assistance from a program that's designed to lift people out of poverty? Minister. Well, as I said uh, in the earlier answer, individuals who, who claim tax credits, such as seniors, those with disabilities, and those who claim Ontario's medical expense tax credit, they would have suffered under the Liberal plan on January 1. About 150,000 filers with allowable Ontario medical expense would have paid $320 more in personal income tax on average. So with our decision, uh, Speaker, these filers will pay $35 million less. When we add that with the business programs that the uh, government was about to tax, uh, we see a massive tax relief for individuals, for seniors, for those on disability, for families, and yes, and for businesses, Speaker. Thank you. Next question, the member for Mississauga Centre. 
Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The question is for the Minister responsible for Francophone Affairs. Mr. Speaker, our government takes concrete measures for Franco Ontarians. Our government proposes three new strategic uh, orientations to be implemented for Ontarians. It is to recognize the contribution, the ongoing contribution of Franco-Ontarians and Francophone people for the last uh, 400 years. Would the minister be able to inform about the work that our government is doing for the Francophone community of Ontario? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my colleague for her question. Our government proposes modification to Law Act 57 to create the position of uh, Commissioner of French Language Services uh, uh, depending on the Ombudsman. The goal is to improve French language services in the province. I am the minister responsible for Francophone affairs. I'm here to advocate for Franco-Ontarians as well as uh, Francophone services. I had the chance to talk to Melanie Jolie, my federal counterpart. I told her I was disappointed by the federal uh, financing for Ontarian. Ont Ontario only receives $2.68 per francophone in the latest agreement. New Brunswick receives almost $7 per inhabitant. And as for Manitoba, question supplementaire. I thank uh, the minister for her statement. is doing for francophones with, with residents in my riding as well as across Ontario. I know that our government inherited a devastating $15 billion deficit and a $346 billion debt from the previous Liberal administration, and that Ontarians are rightly concerned about the financial health of our province. While our government has done great work in finding $3.2 billion in efficiency so far, we know that we still have enormous work to do on the fiscal mess that we inherited from the previous government. Can the Minister for Francophone Affairs explain to this House the measures she is taking to help Francophones in Ontario? Minister. Mr. Speaker, I know that many Francophones in our province have had concerns, and that's why I'm happy to share with this House that our government has proposed amendments to to Bill 57 to create the position of French Language Services Commissioner under the auspices of the Office of the Ombudsman to maintain the independence in conducting investigations and make recommendations and encourage compliance with the French Language Services Act. As the member has pointed out, though, our government inherited a $15 billion deficit and $347 billion in debt from the previous Liberal government. But that's not the only government that has shortchanged Franco-Ontarians, Mr. President. Mr. President. We, have heard, we have heard a lot of talk from the federal Liberals regarding regarding Franco-Ontarians. The truth is they refuse to do their part to fund Franco-Ontarians. The federal government provides the province of Ontario with only $2.78 per francophone to support francophone programming, whereas in New Brunswick, Response. they support francophones $7.31 per francophone, hey, and in $35.71 per francophone. The federal government has invested only $7 million in French language services in Ontario, while our province has Thank you. The Start the clock. Next question, the member for Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the acting Premier. Speaker, according to a CBC report, the Premier has been meeting with well-connected insiders and lobbyists in secret since taking office. We only know about this because the CBC performed a Freedom of Information request to uncover the Premier's schedule. Before this new era of Conservative darkness, the Premiers of all partisan stripes used to make their schedules public so that all Ontarians could see who's bending the ear of the Premier. Why is this Premier keeping his meetings with Conservative Party lobbyists and insiders completely secret from the people of Ontario? The Deputy Premier. 
Government House Leader. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thanks uh, to the member opposite for the question. I can tell you that uh, since our government took office on June 7th and then the Premier and Cabinet were sp sworn in on June 29th, I've never seen a busier Premier than what we have yeah. seen here in Ontario over the last number of months. This Premier works day in and day out. He meets with tens of dozens of hundreds of thousands of people uh, since he's been elected. I can tell you that what his interests are are in the best interests of the people of Ontario, and that's why we've been continuing to work as hard as we have since we were sworn into cabinet to make sure that we're delivering for the people of Ontario. That's why you've already started to see gasoline prices going down, seeing the carbon tax eliminated in Ontario. We've taken steps to get rid of the leadership at C at, uh, and CEO at, uh, at Hydro One and ensure that we're making a difference and that life is more affordable for the people of Ontario, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Yeah, yeah. Supplementary. Speaker, frankly, I, I expected a higher level of spin than that from the minister. He's better than that, Speaker. We know he is. Speaker, it's so much for open and transparent government. The Conservatives can't even manage to publicize the Premier's schedule, which is common practice across the country, Speaker. What the Premier's FOI schedule does make very clear Member is that he's North always able to find South time to meet North. with his well-connected friends. That's who has the Premier's ear, not everyday Ontarians. Speaker, is the Premier keeping these meetings secret Minister because Children, Ontarians and won't Service want to hear what is being discussed by this government in the back rooms of the Premier's office? Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, what I can tell you that the uh, Premier is focused on is ensuring that we're delivering for the people of Ontario, yeah, yeah. who elected us with a massive majority government on June 7th, and they rejected the policies of the NDP, the third party of Ontario, and they do not believe in what they stand for, Mr. Speaker. What we're trying to do here is make Ontario open for business, and the Premier has been meeting Opposition with tens of hundreds of people over the last four or five months to ensure that we're doing just that. And every step that we've taken, Mr. Speaker, every step that we've taken, whether it's lowering electricity prices, lowering taxes, lowering uh, the cost of living in Ontario, the members of the NDP have voted against that each and every time, Mr. Speaker. They just don't get it over there. The people can't take any more of these wild liberal policies, Response. and that's why the people elected Premier Ford, because he is going to deliver for the people of Ontario. That's not spin, that's fact. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Order. Start the clock. Next question. Member for Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy, Northern Development, Mines, and Indigenous Affairs. I know our government is committed to supporting businesses all over Ontario. Investments in business development opportunities is especially important in the north because it helps small businesses expand and create opportunities to grow local economies. These kinds of investments are helping our government send a clear message that Northern Ontario is open for business. I'm proud that our government for the people is standing up for small businesses across the province. We are taking real action to support strong and vibrant communities. Can the minister please tell us about how we are helping Northern Ontario to thrive? Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines, and Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Perry Sound, Muskoka, for his commitment and his great sense of teamwork in helping uh, our Northern Ontario uh, MPPs understand uh, our region's full potential, creating jobs. Uh, and making sure that Northern Ontario is as much as open for business as any other part of the province. We're making investments in science and technology in our major universities and colleges in Northern Ontario, expanding capacity and course offerings for colleges and universities that focus on Indigenous students. We're recognizing, uh, making sure that we make uh, smaller towns and cities 
uh, have the full opportunity to, uh, to attract investments into businesses in their communities, investing in existing businesses that pair Indigenous communities and the private sector together. Now, Mr. Speaker, all of this Response. is coming up in Bill 57 in the fall economic statement. The NDP have sent a strong signal that they don't support these investments, and I can tell you, people on the ground have heard them. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. It's great to hear that our government is making meaningful investments in Northern Ontario. Mr. Speaker, I know that our government is committed to making the right decisions that help us bring economic prosperity to all the people in Ontario. This is a promise that our government for the people takes very seriously. This includes Ontario's Indigenous peoples. Together, we can create economic opportunities with community leaders that deliver economic prosperity for Indigenous peoples across Ontario. Can the minister please tell the members of this House about an important investment our government made at Nipissing First Nation? Minister. To the Minister of Finance. Mr. Finance. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, we were very pleased to announce that Nipissing First Nation received $1 million on Friday to construct a 10,000-square-foot office building along Highway 17. Chief McLeod told me the project is creating 10 full-time jobs and will drive local economic growth. Half of the building will house the Kino Madzawin Education Body's head office. The second half will host a small business incubator, providing office space to local entrepreneurs. This investment is strengthening the economy of the Nipissing First Nation, creating jobs and improving the quality of life for its residents. Uh, speaker, we are sending a strong signal that Northern Ontario is open for business. Thank you. Next question, the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Last Thursday, this Conservative government introduced damaging changes to social assistance that will undoubtedly push those already at a disadvantage even deeper into poverty. By changing the definition of disability to match the federal definition, likely the Canada Pension Plan disability definition, although the minister refuses to tell us if that's what it is, Her it will be even more difficult for Ontarians to receive Ontario disability. Many people with disabilities who are currently eligible for ODSP would not be eligible if they applied under the new criteria. Speaker, will this Conservative government undo its decision to exclude more people under the new definition of disability? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Speaker. It is my pleasure to talk with pride about the plan that we are putting forward in terms of social assistance in the province of Ontario. For those who can work, we are offering them a, a path out of poverty, and for those who cannot work, we will make sure that they receive better and more compassionate support. But don't take my word for it. Take the Ontario Association of Social Workers, who said addressing the root causes of poverty require collaborative solutions. OASW supports the cross-ministry approach of the new program wow. to ensure coordinated and wraparound services that address the physical, emotional, and psychological burden of poverty. Or we can talk about community living of Ontario. The overall move towards a simpler system with fewer rules and less government policing of people's lives is welcome change for the current system built over successive decades, which has trapped people in the cycle of poverty without improved outcomes. I am so delighted to stand Response. here as a part of a government that wants to lift people out of poverty and stabilize their lives and get them back on track. What we're doing is good news for the people. Stop the Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, the minister did not actually answer the question yet again. She refused to answer if they're going to use the Canada Pension Plan disability definition. She's a little busy patting herself on the back, apparently. Back to the minister. The reality is that these changes will hurt real people. I'd like to specifically talk about a man named Dan. Dan receives ODSP because he lives with a learning disability. He qualifies under the current rules. However, if he were to reapply under the CPPD threshold, he would not qualify as he is able to work minimal hours. Being able to work and taking 
taking pride in the work he does is precisely what makes him ineligible under the federal rules that the minister wants to adopt. What the minister is doing, quite simply, is ripping away vital support for people with disabilities. Why, Speaker? Mister. Speaker, what she is saying is simply untrue. We haven't put forward the definition. We're working with uh, the Attorney General's lawyers on that. But let me be perfectly clear. We have instituted a $6,000 annual, uh, annual flat rate earnings exemption. We are consolidating OS, ODSP supplements to simplify things. We are not going to continue to please people. But what we are going to do is lift people out of poverty to the extent that we've never seen in the province of Ontario before. And we're doing that because we're going to provide wraparound supports for those on ODSP and and Ontario Works. And I'll leave her with one final quote from the Ontario Association of Food Banks. The Ontario Association of Food Banks commends the government of Ontario for taking a proactive look at how to improve the income support programs that impact so many of Ontario's most vulnerable people. Why did they say that? Because the plan is good. Stop the clock. I'm going to caution all members once again on the use of intemperate language, and I'm going to have to ask the minister to withdraw the remark that was unparliamentary. Sorry, withdrawn. Next question. Start the clock. The member for Sault Ste. Marie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My speak, uh, Mr. Speaker, my, last week I was very pleased to announce that the Sault Ste. Marie Innovation Centre is receiving $88,521 in funding to advance opportunities in the agricultural sector. The Innovation Centre will use this funding to assist in conducting a Northeast Food and Agriculture Market Study to analyze how we can bring greater economic growth in our community through the agricultural and agri-food sectors. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Can the Minister please tell us how significant investments like this to the Sault Ste. Marie Innovation Centre in my riding can boost economic growth and bring better jobs to our communities? Good question. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member from Sault Ste. Marie for the question. I want to commend the Sault Ste. Marie Innovation Centre for taking the initiative in strengthening its agriculture and agri-food sectors. The funding goes towards the Sault Ste. Marie Innovation Centre in what is one of over 80 approved rural economic development projects in my ministry from across the province that are helping create jobs and bring prosperity to rural and indigenous communities. Our government is proud to support projects that help create jobs and facilitate economic development in rural and indigenous communities such as those in Sault Ste. Marie. Our government is committed to ensuring that rural Ontario is open for business. This program, these investments are part of our government's commitment to remove barriers to economic development and to better position ourselves to attract investment and create jobs for Ontarians across the province. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you uh, to the uh, minister for his answer and his commitment to expanding agricultural opportunities in rural and northern parts of the province. I look forward to continuing to work with our minister to bring more opportunities to those in rural com communities and, in my riding, through great organizations like the Sault Ste. Marie Innovation Centre. Nearly one in eight jobs in Ontario is sustained by the agricultural and agri-food sector, which contributes to a healthy economy that benefits rural and urban communities throughout our province. Mr. Speaker, back to the minister again. Uh, can the minister please tell us what else our government is doing to support economic growth in our great province? Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thanks to the member again. Rural Ontario has been ignored far too long. A strong and vibrant agri-food and agriculture sector is a priority for this government. We're meeting with the farmers in the agri-food sector and we're working with them to address the challenges that they face. We're meeting with the members of the Ontario Greenhouse Alliance here today to work together and address these is their, their issues and the opportunities in the greenhouse industry. We're expanding access to natural gas and broadband. We're committed to creating better jobs across the province. We are working with rural and northern communities to help ensure that all Ontarian, Ontario is open for business. Our government is strengthening rural communities across the province for Ontarians today and for generations to come. 
Next question, the member for Beaches East Shore. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Last Thursday, the Conservatives announced changes to Ontario's social assistance program with zero acknowledgement of the impact to Ontarians who cannot work because they're too sick. Under the Ford government, Ontarians facing health scares like cancer now have additional challenges while they fight for their very lives. Just last week, this government voted down a motion that would provide take-home cancer drugs while comparing cancer patients to spoiled children. Can the minister confirm whether this government's new restrictions will mean that Ontarians, Ontarians who cannot work because of temporary illness will no longer qualify for social assistance? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Speaker, again, I reject the premise of the question. We came forward with the most compassionate, life-stabilizing plan for social assistance in the province's history. That's why everyone from the city of Hamilton to the Nipissing DSAB to the Ontario Food Banks Association Order. to Community Living Toronto and almost anybody in between has come out and said that this is a good plan for the people. Let me read to you what Donald Sant said. Awesome job today. Quite impressive. A whole breath of fresh air to programs that have gone stagnant and from some presently on ODSP. We are going to provide wraparound supports throughout this entire government, which is what is different on this program complete from any other program in the history of this province. That's why I'm working with the Minister of Training for Skills Development, why I'm working with the Minister of Health for health and, and mental health and addiction support. Response. I'm working with the Minister of Housing so we can provide better support of housing. We are looking at the individual throughout the entire ministries of this government, not just in silos. <laughs> Off the clock. Restart the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Once again, the minister has not answered the question. I have heard from many people who have told me they have no choice but to go on Ontario disability because they have cancer or are far too ill to work at the moment, and they are frightened. They tell me that chemotherapy is exhausting and has side effects like severe fatigue that makes it hard to work. But this government seems to think that escaping poverty is a simple choice. People do not choose to be sick. Can the minister please explain whether cancer patients and other sick Ontarians who are on Ontario disability because they cannot work will experience a loss in financial support, which, by the way, is not compassionate? Minister. The members opposite can't take yes for an answer ever. I mean, Speaker, our, our plan is focused on the people. It will help those who can work, stabilize their lives, get back on track, and get out of and get on a path at, out of po uh, poverty. For those who cannot work, we are providing greater wraparound supports, greater Opposition flexibility, and allowing those who may be able to work to take home more of their pay. I'm proud of this plan, as are many other stakeholders across Ontario. But I got to say, Speaker, if, if the member opposite actually thought the previous plan was working, one million people on Ontario works in ODSP, $10 billion program, and still one in seven people are living in poverty. And that's why welfare isn't working. Simply Position paying people to sit at home is not smart. It makes little sense simply transferring money to people so they can stay at home. Who said that, Speaker? Bob Ray. Bob Ray. Stop the talk. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Haldeman North. Question for the uh, Minister of Transportation. I understand the Minister was in uh, London last week to deliver an important announcement about oh. this winter's commute. He was. Each year, we, as we know, we work with our safety partners like the OPP, CAA, others to remind drivers to uh, travel safely as the weather starts to change. Our government is committed to ensuring the winter travel is as easy and as safe as possible. We strive to encourage safe and cautious driving 
by also highlighting our winter maintenance activities to help drivers be better prepared for the coming winter months. Obviously, winter's on the way. Snow is already affecting parts of the province. Can the minister share some details with us about our government's winter maintenance plan? Minister of Transportation. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. And I would uh, like to take the opportunity to thank the member from Haldeman Norfolk on that question. And I do have to say that uh, when I was Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry, he was an excellent parliamentary assistant. Guidance and his, his years of work in the legislature are truly paying off for the people of this province. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, last week it was my pleasure to attend the MCON maintenance facility in London with many of my colleagues. As the member mentioned, winter is on its way and, and many parts of the province are already experiencing snowy conditions. This winter season, our government is making the winter commute easier for people of Ontario. This year, we are allowing drivers to track their plow and plan their route all at one stop. The Ontario 511 website, where you'll be able to find information you need for your trip. And I'm hoping the members opposite are listening to this because I'm going to hear questions about winter maintenance. So I'm hoping they'll take the time and listen to this uh, answer. Response. Given the treacherous driving conditions Ontario has experienced this time of year, please remember to slow down, be patient, and expect longer travel times. And I look forward to expanding my answer in the supplemental. Well, uh, Speaker, I do want to thank the Minister for that shout-out, but I, I do want to reiterate that all drivers should give themselves more time during winter travel and plan ahead. We all have a duty to keep our roads and highways safe. Make sure you get a head start. Assemble a uh, winter survival kit. Get your vehicle uh, maintenance checkup. We should all find comfort in knowing that Ontario has some of the highest winter maintenance standards anywhere in North America, and keeping Ontario's highways as safe as possible during uh, winter weather is a top priority. I'm asking the minister, could you expand a bit more on your winter maintenance plan, and what can people expect from the Ontario 511 website? Minister. Thank you again uh, for that question. And you know, our government for people is improving the Ontario 511 website by allowing drivers to plan ahead to see where along the route you might come across a snowplow or salt truck and which part of the route that truck has already been covered. Before the end of this year, the Ontario 511 website will also provide drivers with reported incidents, traffic jams, and weather hazards. Now, also, especially for our northern members who are going to be asking questions and making sure that the maintenance is happening, we are starting to implement new maintenance contract models that improve on highway serv maintenance services, and I expect to have some report back from these members as we go forward to make sure that we've made the necessary changes. The new contracts will include specifying the amount of winter equipment in the routes, explicit patrolling requirements and the use of anti-icing liquids and newer winter equipment that will be more visible. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to tell the people of this province to remember that keeping our roads safe is all of our responsibilities. We have to work together to keep our highways among the safest in North America. Next question, the member for Brampton East. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Currently, there's a bill before the House that prioritizes insurance companies over drivers. Wow, the auto insurance bill introduced by a member of the Conservative government does not end postal code discrimination for anyone due to its glaring loopholes. What's worse is that the Conservative Party has stood steadfast against reforming auto insurance to make it more affordable for Ontarians. This leaves me wondering. What this government's priorities really are? Why is this government not prioritizing lowering auto insurance rates for everyday Ontarians? Minister of Finance. Well, uh, Speaker, it once again gives me an opportunity to congratulate the member from Milton for his important work on this file. Speaker, the member from Milton's initiative is a great, weight, a great way to combat rate discrimination in our auto insurance system, and we look forward, we really do look forward to working with you on this important legislation because, unlike the member opposite, our member from Milton actually consulted with uh, organizations and groups. He 
talked to all of the people who are involved, and was able to develop a proper bill and brought it to the floor of this legislature and is receiving you, uh, wonderful Response. support right across the system. Yeah. Again, I want to congratulate the member from Milton member on his from bill. Milton. That concludes the question period time for this morning. I recognize the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs on a point of order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, on a point of order, earlier it wasn't my, uh, my fault, but uh, the mayor was not yet in the legislature, so I uh, thought I would do, introduce him now. So, uh, the, His Worship Mayor Trevor Birch from the City of Woodstock. Thank you very much for being here. The Minister of Finance, I understand, has a point of order. The point of order, uh, Speaker. I want to correct my record. I, uh, in an earlier answer, I may have said 308 billion, and I meant to say 308 million. Thank you. On November 26, 2018, the member for Guelph, Mr. Schreiner, provided written notice of his intention to raise a question of privilege with respect to Bill 57, an act to enact, amend, and repeal various statutes, the Restoring Trust, Transparency and Accountability Act. I am prepared to rule on this matter without hearing further from the member, as Standing Order 21D permits me to do. I first want to address the matter of timeliness of the member's question of privilege. It has been several days since Bill 57 received first reading on November 15, 2018. The House met on four sessional days over 10 calendar days following the first reading of Bill 57. This points to a lack of timeliness in submitting the notice. As noted in Beauchene's Parliamentary Rules and Forms, 6th edition, page 29, and I quote, question of privilege must be brought to the attention of the House at the first possible opportunity. Even a gap of a few days may invalidate the claim for precedence in the House, end quote. While I appreciate that the member for Guelph has limited resources at his disposal, I want to stress to members that it's very important that they do not delay raising a question of privilege, lest it be ruled out of order due to the passage of time. The issue of timeliness aside, the member's question of privilege attempts to preempt the legislative processes of this House. The matter relates to the potential impact of the changes to the roles and status of certain officers of Parliament proposed in Bill 57. The member is asking the Speaker to determine if these proposed changes might amount to a form of obstruction, interference and intimidation of those officers by the government. There is substantial precedent and universal support for the notion that the Speaker does not have the authority to engage in statutory interpretation. From a procedural perspective, Bill 57 is properly before the House at the present time, and it would be preemptive of the Speaker to determine whether there are any issues of the nature that the member arises when the House has not yet completed its consideration of or has made a decision on the bill. Ultimately, it's for the House to decide if the proposed measures need to be amended in order to guarantee the independence of its parliamentary officers. The member has therefore not established a prima facie case of privilege. There being no deferred votes, this House stands in recess until 1 p.m. <laughs>